Hi everyone, I'm Jenna Payone with A Mighty Blaze, and I'm so thrilled to be here today with these two fabulous female authors, Carrie Maher and Elise Hooper. We are here to celebrate the release of Elise's new book, Fast Girls. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there it is. It's such a stunning cover. I, I love the cover. It's so beautiful. I know. Mauro just knocked it out of the ballpark from like the first. This is kind of, I think, the only version I ever got. It's great. They did such a good job. I love it. I love it. It's perfect. Congratulations on the book. We're so thrilled for you. It's such an incredible story. And of course, I mean, it's it's fulfilling all of our Olympic, uh, you know, dreams right now. I always say my favorite part of the Olympics are the uh, the special interest stories and your book is is a whole special interest <laughs> story. I, I live for, you know, the snippets in between yeah. the moment where we're like, oh, we're going to find out where this gymnast trained for the past 12 years. And really, that's what your your book is in some ways is an expert right. in these women and their lives, which we will get to. Um, but both of you are fabulous. Um, and I have to mention Carrie, the girl in the white gloves. Um, your book came out in February 2020, right before all of this happened. I went to one of your last book events, which uh, was so fun. And you had the most beautiful cake with the uh, with the girl in the white gloves book cover on it. And I still remember uh, how good that cake tasted. <laughs> yeah. It was a great cake. <laughs> it was a great cake. And it was, it was so fun. I can't believe that just a few months ago, we were all still meeting in person, um, you know, and doing these these events live. But I'm thrilled that we're able to do this virtually and have this great conversation today. Um, congratulations to you both. I am going to introduce these ladies, and then um, I'm going to let Carrie take it away and chat with Elise a little bit about Fast Girls, ask her some questions. And I have some questions for both of them, because both of these women you know, write, they both write historical fiction and they both, both write about strong women and often strong women from history who really lived, um, who maybe you haven't heard of as much, maybe you haven't gotten, uh, you know, into the, the, the consciousness of the general public, or maybe it's a different story as in the case of Grace Kelly, where obviously we all know Grace Kelly, but how well do any of us really know her? Uh, so I am thrilled to talk to you both about that. Without further ado, let me introduce these wonderful women. First up, we have Carrie Maher. Carrie Maher lives in Massachusetts, but she was born in California and will always identify as a California girl at heart. She is the author of The Kennedy Debutante, which People Magazine described as a riveting reimagining of a true tale of forbidden love. And This Is Not a Writing Manual, Notes for the Young Writer in the Real World, which is such a great writing book if anyone is looking for um you know a, a book about craft and the process of writing and what it's like please pick that up um, and that was published under uh, the name carrie majors so look for it she holds an mfa from columbia university and founded yarn an award-winning literary journal of short form ya fiction a writing professor for many years she now writes full-time and lives with her daughter and dog in a leafy suburb west of boston her most recent release, The Girl in the White Gloves, is a dazzling portrait into one of the most glamorous, into the life of the, one of the most glamorous women to ever live, Grace Kelly. And it's so great. I mean, like told, it's just such a, such a, an in-depth and, and close portrait of this, uh, this woman that so many of us hold in our, our heads as this ideal of sophistication and elegance. Um, but it really gets into who she is as a person behind that. And of, of The Girl in the White Gloves, Women's World says, in this charming, picturesque novel, readers are swept away. This story is a glimpse into the dazzling life of a classic and beloved star. And Philadelphia Magazine says, Mayer's biopic feels as if it was written by Kelly herself. The novel spins a fascinating version of the Philly native's life from Princess of Hollywood to Princess of Monaco. And Book Tribe calls it a thoughtful and moving book that ably illuminates a struggling, albeit determined, princess. Carrie, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And now the star of today, Elise Hooper, author of Fast Girls, 
I just loved Elise's bio on her um, on her page. It's so memorable. So I'm going to uh, steal a little bit of it and and paraphrase in my own words. But Elise grew up in New England as a bona fide bookworm. Her love of reading, paired with what she calls an overly active imagination, which of course don't we all have those, <laughs> led her to believe she was born in the wrong era and inspired a love of history and still storytelling. After eventually moving to the West Coast and attending grad school, Elise spent several years writing for television and online news outlets, teaching high school literature and history, and writing whenever she had the chance. Her main characters tend to be based on the lives of real women who have been frequently overlooked in history books. She is the author of The Other Alcott and Learning to See, and her most recent release, Fast Girl explores the gripping real life history of female athletes, members of the first integrated women's Olympic team and their journeys to the 1936 summer games in Berlin, which of course, Nazi Germany, which is, I mean, the setup of that, I, I don't, I can't wait to talk about this novel. It's just such a great, such a great setup. Fast Girls is one of Real Simple's best books of, 2000, of 2020 a most anticipated summer read for 2020 from Travel and Leisure, and a Hollywood Reporter pick for summer 2020. Of Fast Girls, book list says, Hooper celebrates three unheralded female athletes in a tale spanning three Olympiads. For fans of David James Brown's The Boys in the Boat, historical fiction about real people and stories about little known female heroes breaking through barriers. And Real Simple says, told in intricate detail against the backdrop of a world on the brink of war, the novel shines a light on these long overlooked athletes. Elise, welcome and congratulations. Thank on that. you. Can we, you talk every morning? Cause you're making me feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the most fun part. I'm like, this is where I just sit here and praise you guys for 20 minutes. And I'm like, it's nice though, you deserve it. Like applause because writing a book is really hard and you're getting denied this, the, the best part of like going ar around and actually getting to meet people in person who admire your books. So we want you to feel loved. We're thrilled that you're here. And without further ado, let's talk about Fast Girls cause this is why we're really here. Thank you. Let's definitely talk about it. And thank you so much, Jenna. Um, Jenna. Um, also, I want to listen to that over my morning coffee every morning. Also. <laughs> yeah. I'll say, and you know, I know lots of people say this, but it's probably, I think it's worth hearing again and again. Um, the, the silver lining to this like quarantine book launch situation that we're all in is that actually Elise and I can talk to you guys. I, I, it was funny listening to your introductions of us both. I forget sometimes that we, we cross the country on each other. So I'm from the wow. West Coast and have wound up in Massachusetts. Um, Elise is from Massachusetts and has wound up on the West Coast. Um, and we met um, almost two years ago at Newtonville Books in Newton, Massachusetts. Um, and I went to an event that she did there with Annie Harnett, um, who oh, interviewed her there for Learning to See. And um, I just went as a fangirl <laughs> and like, I just, I wanted to meet her. And so, and actually the rest is history because we went out for drinks afterward and hit it off. And now we're like friends and critique partners. And it's yeah. like really exciting to get to interview her um, with all of you guys watching. So um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to mention, sorry, before we get into the first question, um, for all of our viewers out there, if you have any questions for these ladies, because we do like to simulate real life book events. So if you have any questions, please put them in the comments um, and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of the day. Yeah. But, sorry. Take it away, Carrie. All right. So Elise, what attracted you to the idea of writing about these three ladies for Fast Girls? Well, I mean, honestly, I have been probably a thwarted Olympian my whole life. And I say that with like completely kidding because I have never come near the Olympics as an athlete, but I played sports my whole life and, and come as a complete super fan. Like I have so many memories as a kid of watching the Olympics with my family and like doing dives in my grandparents' pool and just having my grandfather give me 10 after 10 after 10, even though my dives were terrible. Like I, I mean, I think a lot of us have dreamed about being an Olympian and especially growing up outside of Boston where, I mean, Boston has a very rich 
long history with the Olympics. And so I grew up watching the Boston Marathon and Joan Benoit winning several times. Um, Kitty and Peter Carruthers, I don't know if you remember them, the skaters, I wrote them fan mail and got these beautiful glossy photos from them. And I first saw Peggy Fleming skate in the ice capades in Boston. And that's when I decided I need to become a figure skater. And so I figure skated for several years, all the while dreaming of the Olympics. Um, and, and just ever since I've played, all kinds of sports have run and um, I play co competitive league tennis now. I mean, so it's funny, my first two books were about artists, but it's a, it, it was actually my younger daughter. Here, I have a picture of this actually. Yeah. My younger daughter, let me show everyone. Um, here we go. Well, there's a little sort of picture of Fast Girls, but here's my younger daughter. She's there on the left with the Eat My Bubbles written in Sharpie on her back. <laughs> This is a few years ago, but she um, needed to pick a biography project for library class. And she picked Gertrude Ederly, who's there on the right. Now, Ederly was someone I'd never heard of. She was she won three medals in swimming in the 1924 Olympics in Paris. And for most of us, that would be enough, right? Three Olympic medals. I'm ready to retire. But she instead set her sights on, she wanted to become the first woman to swim the English Channel. And so that's what she's doing in that photo. She's actually covered in lard there. I mean, look at those goggles. It's, and so my daughter chose Ederly to be this biography project. And as I was helping her, I was just struck by the fact that although Ederly came home from this feat and was feted as a, as a major celebrity, like Amelia Earhart. She got a ticker tape parade in Manhattan and everything. President Wilson called her America's best girl. I, I had never heard of her. So it really made me think like, I need to learn more about trailblazing women Olympians because I think there is a story there. And sure enough, I was so delighted to like learn about all of these different, I mean, there's some early women Olympians. They start competing at about 1900 in a variety of events. Look at that gal up on the top left. She was a sailor, if you can believe it. First woman ever to win a gold medal. Wow. Archery, diving, swimming, tennis, of course. These were all sports kind of associated with a upper class. And so track and field was banned for women for many, many years. It won't be till 1928 that women first are allowed to um, sort of slum it in the Olympics, like the Olympics considered themselves to be slumming it a bit with these letting these women enter. And it's all because of this woman uh, who's sitting there rowing, Alice Milliot, who was a French woman and she petitioned to the International Olympic Committee to have uh, Olympics for women, like to include more events. And of course the IOC denied her. And like such a great woman, she refused to be denied. And so she threw her own Olympics and she really knew how to do it because she threw it in Monte Carlo. She had a huge turnout for several in a row. And so eventually the IOC came, and that's how we have um, several women, like one of my main characters, there's Betty Robinson. She is one of the first women to uh, compete in track and field in 1928, this first year they're allowed to be there. That's her parents on the right when she comes home. But the photo on the left there is her in Amsterdam in these 1928 games. She showed up as a 16-year-old schoolgirl. She had run only a handful of races. The trajectory to the Olympics was much swifter back in 1928 than it is today when you know athletes spend their whole lives training. She had just been spotted running for the train by a teacher and he thought she looked fast. And next thing she knew, she had been invited to the Olympics and she was a real underdog. Like no one really expected much from this little schoolgirl. And she pulled off this huge upset and won a gold medal. And, and so she really starts this whole this whole sort of career now that Americans are famous for doing so well in Olympic track and field. But Betty really started it all. And, um, and so I found her story after digging around in kind of history books and the internet. And that's when I knew, I, okay, I have a story here. Here's, and she just was my first of my main characters, but her story, I just couldn't believe I had never heard it before. So did you ever consider making it only about Betty or did you, did you, no, you knew no. that you wanted to tell a broader story from the get-go. Yeah, you know, and I, I can't really tell you why I felt that way. I think it's almost like, you know, sometimes I think as writers, we can appreciate that it's sort of a chemistry thing, like falling in love. Okay. You, just, yes. yeah, you just sort of know. And um, I'll give you a little more information about Betty's story, because this is where, like, fiction becomes kind of crazier than real life. So let me go back to my, my pictures here. Um, Betty 
comes home and she's training for 1932, the Olympics in Los Angeles, and she's in a plane crash. And doctors tell her, you know, give up all your dreams of running. You'll be lucky to ever walk again, much less run. But Betty was not a woman to be denied. And there she is on the left. Um, I was in touch with her family while I was working on the story and they gave me some of these wonderful photos. She's there with a nurse, look at, she's still smiling in her wheelchair. There on the right, she's, I don't know still what that PT device is, but she's working in some physical therapy. She did not take no for an answer. And she came back and she'll combine, she'll meet up with these two other main characters of mine, Louise Stokes and Helen Stevens to compete in these 1936 Olympics. Like Jenna, what you were saying is sort of the headlining games. Everyone's fascinated by these Berlin games. But Betty's story, like to be this sort of upset and win a gold medal in the first year ever women could do this and then have this plane crash and come back for this amazing comeback story. Like I, my mind was blown. I just couldn't believe I had never heard of her. So while it, I can definitely see why she could have been my only um, main character, but I was casting my net a little wider because I really wanted to show how so many different women were coming to the Olympics from a variety of different backgrounds. That was really important for me to show the different paths that women um, traveled to get there. And so Betty, like by using Betty and then Louise, let's see, I think I have a, yep, there's Louise. Um, Louise grew up, so by you in Massachusetts, she was in Malden. She was known as the Malden, Malden Meteor. She was one of the few black girls in town and she just kind of rose up through the New England racing circuit and is invited to try out for these 1932 games in Los Angeles. And she becomes, there she is, she's circled on the right and then Tidy Pickett is there on the left. These are then the first two black women ever to qualify for an American Olympic team. They qualified in track and field. And um, so Louise has a really different path from Betty. Um, and, and her experience will be really different. Whereas Betty is celebrated for her accomplishments. Louise, and I'll just sort of give everyone a hint of what's to come here. All of these candid team photos from 1932 and 36, you don't see Louise or Tidy in any of them. It's just a sea of white faces. So Louise will have a very different experience than Betty. And that was really important for me to kind of show again, this range of experience of women. Um, so, so this was actually gonna be my next question was, tell me more about, the, you have three main characters in this book. Yeah. So Betty Robinson, Louise Stokes and Helen Stevens. So, yeah. let's, so let's hear a little bit more about Helen too. So Helen, I think Helen is the athlete we would all know of. I'd like to think she'd be on US postage stamps and stuff if she'd been able to have a longer career. When in fact the world, you know, World War II will come along and lead to 1940 and 44 being canceled. But Helen is this teenager in rural Missouri. Um, she was a real outcast for many years. She ends up being six feet tall. She has a birthmark over her eye. She was, um, she had a really husky voice. She was a tomboy. In a, in a society, in a community that really values sort of conventionality and girls who wanted to become married and grow up and raise a family and live in a pretty house. And that just didn't interest Helen at all. She was super athletic. Her family was always discouraging her really from pursuing her athletic dreams. But this coach who she's pictured with there, Coach Moore, he spots her playing basketball for her church team. And he can just see, like for all of us who have kids and we've watched sort of on the sidelines, there is often a kid who you can just see, they're kind of sprinkled with magic dust. They're very special. And Helen was one of those and he spotted her. And this was a part of the story that I just love was that, you know, he didn't, it didn't give him pause at all that she was a girl. He just sees her talent and he wants to do everything he can to pull her along. So he ends up buying her track shoes. He advocates for her to be able to compete with the boys in her track team at her school, even though people thought that was unnatural and really were against it. He just sees her potential and doesn't want to let it go. And so he's a great example, I think, of you know how we can all pull up chairs to other people who are being marginalized. He wanted to see her succeed and he really goes above and beyond. And so Helen is sort of thrown, she is really like, well, Louise was known as the Malden Meteor. Helen becomes the Fulton Flash and she just really knocks the socks off of everyone yeah. from the beginning. And so her, her trip to the Olympics will be a little longer than Betty's only because 
essentially Helen is discovered in like 1935 and the Olympics are about a year later. So she spends that year racing and raising her profile, but all the while she becomes one of the country's big hopes for Berlin. And in fact, she is such a com fierce competitor. She is truly unstoppable. Hitler really wants to meet her. And so that is, she's with Hitler there in that photo on the right um, in one of, an account of one of the craziest sort of um, things I'd ever read. I mean, many parts of Fast Girls, it's like the truest parts are sort of the craziest. And so there I have a photo of like, I went to the Helen Stevens collection in Missouri to visit her archives. And that's her handwritten diary there on the left about Berlin. And, and, and I have it opened there to a page where she meets Hitler and she kind of roughly describes that. I worked um, with her official biographer to actually kind of also better understand the story behind Helen. There I am holding her size 12 track shoes. Like I said, she was very, tall. She had a nine foot stride, which is just so unbelievable. Um, and so she just became like another entry point, very different growing up. Again, this is the Great Depression. She is poor. She has a really different path into the Olympics. She's kind of not the celebrity that Betty is. And, and in some ways, she's an insider, unlike Louise, although I don't think Helen would have ever considered herself an insider. But she was just because her talent was no one could avoid it. She was so good that she just kind of emerged on the scene and everyone had to pay attention to her. So her little town in Missouri went from viewing her as an outcast to eventually actually having Helen Stevens Day and a parade for her um, even before the Olympics. So it's kind of a cool transformation really that her story embraces. And like, I had a lot of fun at one point in the book she, when she comes back from this first big meet where she beats a world record holder, she, um, the local salon invites her to come for a makeover. And it was kind of this fun, pretty moment, pretty woman moment I was able to describe where she gets her hair done, and new clothes, like she has no idea how to wear a girdle, like all of these things, they find high heels for her in size 12. It's, it's just a really neat story of all these again, sort of different examples of how women were finding their way into athletics at a time when they were largely discouraged from doing so. Um, I loved all those scenes in the books. And I, you know, and something you sort of mentioned that I want to also just say to, to, to people in the audience, like I, I got to read this um, in an earlier draft. And one of the things that was surprising and such a pleasure about this book was that we start quite a ways before 1936. So we really do get to see these three women's very different paths to getting to the Olympics. Um, it was very moving in that way. So that when we get there to 1936, like you're you're really like on that track with them and really rooting for them and um, every both all three of them in the, in their different ways and their friends also like. You mentioned Tidy. I'm not going to say anything more, but she's an important um, smaller character in the book. Um, so that's all was just such a thrilling part of reading the book. Um, so, okay, so these are three very different women. Um, so I'm wondering if like your research for the three of them had to be take different forms. Like I love that picture of you in the museum in Missouri. I did the other two have museum rooms dedicated to them. Like what kinds of different things did you experience for all of them? Right. So Helen was this great documenter of her life. She actually, for being such an athlete, she was also pretty bookish and very interested in history. And she pretty early on knew she was sort of destined for the history book. So she was collecting everything. I think that's actually something that we're kind of missing in today's society. Like we don't really scrapbook. We just take pictures right on our phone of everything. But, but it was really exciting to go visit all these artifacts of Helen's. Um, Betty is a different story in the sense that her family, they saved things too. Um, and I was in touch with her family. In fact, she has a granddaughter who lives right outside of Boston, who's been an enormous help to me. Um, and so, you know, both Helen and Betty had biographies written on them. So there was some information I could find there. They were both written up large, you know, widely in newspapers. Um, and I used a lot of vintage newspapers actually while researching this story. I loved the newspapers. And just sort of the crazy way they talk about like the buxom gal in lane three who was raring for a fight. Looks like a real handful. Maybe we're in for a cat fight here. I mean, that's how these journalists wrote about the women. So in fact, that prompted me to write newspaper stories for the book to kind I of- I love those sections, yes. Give readers a sense of how people were viewing these women. Um, but so, but the real gap for me in the historical record was Louise Stokes. She, there's just not much about her. And so um, in kind of a funny full circle sort of way, um, 
one of the books my daughter had used to research Gertrude Ederly was written by Glenn Stout. And Glenn Stout was a sports reporter out of Boston. He's now in Vermont. I tracked him down and because he had written a story in the late 70s about Louise, just, just an article for the Boston Globe. And yet it was really the most extensive source I could find on her. So I got in touch with him and I was like, hey, what can you, can you help me with Louise? Like, what do you know about her? And he had accumulated this huge file. He had spent hours in the Malden Public Library going through microfiche. And he sent this huge file to me, told me I could copy it and just asked me to send it back. It was so generous. He saved my eyesight, first of all, because we all know how difficult microfiche can be. Um, but another, you know, great example of a man wanting to kind of Put, bring a woman into the spotlight and maybe um, he kind of saw this as a great opportunity to do so. So he was really generous in his support. And he just had, he had talked to Louise's family at one point, he had all these articles. And so I was able to kind of cobble together a rough outline of Louise's life. And then I just did a lot of research into what her life as a young black woman in Massachusetts would have been like during that period. And also there were certain accounts from other women athletes, other women Olympians who do mention Tidy and Louise, who I was able to then sort of pull their stories in to kind of build the narrative as I could picture it for Louise. But I did have to take some, I did have to use my imagination extensively in Louise's case, like the Uncle Freddie character, for example, for anyone who's read it, he is a fictional character. Um, at one point when I first started reading about Malden, I came across, and this was like probably 2017, I read about a monument. And I actually think I have, of course, a picture about this. You're Let's so see. great with the pictures. I love the pictures. This is like great. This is so fun and interactive. <laughs> Let's see. I know. I love the pictures too. They are so fun. Okay, so there I am in Malden. I'm there on the train tracks. I found them in a strip mall parking lot in Malden. This is where Louise trained. That's actually a statue to her. That's like kind of one of the few things that exist now to celebrate Louise's life. That's in the Malden High School courtyard. But really, um, I found the story of this monument, the one that's there on the far left. Now that's a World War I monument that was unveiled in uh, July 4th, uh, 1920, and it was dedicated to the men who had fought in World War I in Malden. But what historians were finding in 2017 was it was a list of about 500 names and it was leaving out about 1500 other names, black soldiers, women who served in World War I. It was a very incomplete kind of uh, record of um, these veterans. And so Uncle Freddie is kind of inspired then by one of these veterans who would have come home, that's a photo of them up on the top left, who would have come home and really not been recognized for his service because of the color of his skin. And of course, I'm trying to draw the parallel there between what will happen with Louise trying to represent her country as an athlete and the many ways she will not kind of find her efforts reciprocated by her countrymen. But what was so neat, and I think this is so relevant right now when we think about the news and monuments, is Malden decided to raise, they ended up raising about $50,000 to build those two additional monuments there on the side of the original, the original one is the white one. Those two on the side then list all the 1500 other names of veterans who were overlooked by Malden. And so that just felt like, I mean, there was no clear connection there to Fast Girls, but I could just kind of imagine what that would have been like for Louise's family. And so that's where historical fiction is so fun, right? You kind of learn something and you can see how this could play into your broader narrative. And so that was kind of the creation of this Uncle Freddie character. Louise, there is a scene where they see this monument unveiled and his, his, he's not mentioned on it. So just trying to, again, um, connect all the dots here. But so, um, it's, you know, and I think probably, you know, Grace Kelly's life was very well documented too, but you can always find these things that maybe not many people know or they've never made it out into the public, these little anecdotes. And these are where kind of the gems of historical fiction lie, where you can really help humanize these figures who maybe have kind of loomed large, like in the case of Grace Kelly. In the case of these three women Olympians, very few people know their names today, but um, maybe we'll sort of change that over time, of, of course, is the hope. But but so I did have to take a really different approach to all of these different women. Um, and that was the fun of it. I mean, I got to learn so much. This book was such an adventure for me. Yeah, I often say to people that like, actually the research part of historical fiction is as much fun as the writing part. Like the learning, 
about the subject, about the time period. There's just, there's so much like fun stuff to learn and like, and be surprised by, right? Exactly like you said. I mean, the surprises are such a pleasure. And like, you know, there are some surprises that you're like, oh, I just gotta make it fit in here somewhere. <laughs> um, well, so speaking of like fun surprises, I've heard, I understand that you've made a, an, a fun discovery since the publication of the book. So tell us, tell us. I know, you know, you send a book out into the world and you never know what will happen. And in the case of this one, it was so exciting to me that um, while I was researching it, I did find one of the secondary characters in Fast Girls is this woman named Gertrude Wilhelmsen. And she, um, she, she doesn't get much mention in Fast Girls. I couldn't find a ton about her, but she was an Olympian from Puyallup, Washington, which is not far from me at all. Well, my local, one of my local bookstores here in West Seattle um, put a picture of Fast Girls on their Instagram account. And um, a woman commented, wait a minute, my uh, husband's grandmother was on that Olympic team too. And I saw the comment and I was like, oh my gosh, what? So I got in touch with her and it turned out they had just inherited this big collection of Gertrude's things, like her collection. And I actually have some really, um, you know, let's go back to the pictures here. But I have some really amazing pictures of Gertrude's life. Um, let me skip through here. Okay, so Gertrude is one of the few of these women Olympians who is actually married. And she goes to the Olympics with, a, she has a two-year-old daughter that she leaves at home with her husband. He sends her off like <laughs> with all feelings of, you know, goodwill to go and compete. Um, Gertrude competed in javelin. Uh, and uh, I think another field event, but she, this family who lives right down the street from me has all this stuff. They showed me these photos. Um, they had, her collection of scrapbooking is amazing. There's a, and this is kind of like when I talked about earlier how I created these newspaper articles to kind of reflect these women's lives. There's Gertrude like lined up this cute little photo of all these girl Olympians, right? Um, uh, I think they're in Berlin here, or maybe in New York City, I'm not sure, right before the Olympics, as they're on their way to Berlin. There's Gertrude in the middle in the Puyallup uh, local paper with her sister, who also tried to qualify. She went, they both traveled to uh, Providence, Rhode Island for this 1936 Olympic trials. And to just be really clear with everyone, this was a big adventure. I mean, these girls have probably never left the Puget Sound area. And suddenly they're on a train to Rhode Island. And then in the case of Gertrude, because she qualifies, she's on a boat to Berlin. So it's a really amazing uh, story there. And then that far right newspaper story with the Olympic fashion. I mean, the women athletes, like today, we can see parallels, are always kind of used to show like, what were they wearing? Who wore it best? And then this was such an exciting find. Um, for anyone who's read the book yet, there's, an in, there's a party that some of the women attend in Berlin in real life, and I make a note of this in the novel, it happens after the Olympics. It was kind of the, the final party. In my case, I moved it up a little for reasons that I explained, but the, this, Gertrude had an invitation, like it's a personalized invitation. You can see it says to Fraulein Wilhelmsen to this party. And the invitation is so beautiful, look at it. But it was the creepiest party, like Goebbels, Goring were there. It's like, it has me too written all over this, kind of yucky encounter that the women have there. Um, but it was just such an amazing find that like these neighbors of mine here in West Seattle had just inherited all of this stuff. I mean, the, the, the things they have, they have a torch that Gertrude ran with later in 1996 wow. when she was like part of one of those relays taking the torch to Atlanta as an older woman, of course. Um, it, it was just such a such a gratifying find. And I, boy, am I so glad she was in my book because that just made it extra special. And so I just love how books kind of can live on and take like all new types of adventures as you go along with them. It's really true. It's really true. Um, Jenna, I, I have lots more questions for Lisa. I want to check in with you on time. Can I ask her at least? Okay. We're doing good on time. I actually have a question for both of you though. As I'm, as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, you know, especially at least I'm, all of this this uh, information that you've gotten is amazing. And you know the fact that the families and all of these people were willing to help you is amazing as well. I, I'm wondering, do you then is it ever does it ever get hard to to have to take some creative liberties That's in order to, you know, really show the both sides, you know, you can't have, 
a book where nobody makes the wrong choice ever, especially with, with a protagonist. Um, and I'm wondering if that was ever a challenge for you in writing this. And Carrie, I'm going to ask you the same question. But, but first, Elise, especially having now connections to some family members and things like that, um, did you, was that tricky for you to navigate? To, to yeah, it's, make sure it's that like, you presented. Absolutely. I mean, it could definitely go wrong for sure. Um, I was really lucky. You know, I was so anxious. I should say that I wrote this novel um, with some input, like with Helen's biographer. She actually welcomed me to Missouri, took me around all of he Helen's spots. And I did keep saying to her, like, you know, I'm going to be taking some fictional liberties. I'm connecting this with two other women. Um, and I really have found that overall, everyone is just so excited. They're hopeful that these women finally get some time in the sun, quite honestly, that that people understand that times have changed and um, people sort of behave differently now than they might have back then. And so, you know, I have found these families to be so gracious. Um, they really were wonderful about, like they didn't give me any sort of hard times about any, things I did with these women. In the case of Betty, Betty's life was a little more blue collar actually. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, to make that my contrast between my three main characters, like I did actually, um, you know, kind of raise maybe her social class a bit. And and her, her daughter was kind of laughed at it and said, but I understand why you did that. I mean, they were so gracious and generous in their praise of kind of um, just again, seeing their, these lives um, sort of brought to a broader audience. And, and I'm just so grateful for that because it must be really strange to see someone you've known and loved kind of brought to the page. Um, maybe you're surprised in some ways at their depiction. And I always made a point of like, I hope my Betty that I've imagined or my Helen or, you know, it gets a bit of the woman you know. And they all definitely have been very gracious about like the spirit is absolutely there. And they've been sort of surprised, like, you know, um, especially in Betty's family, they've been lovely about like, they didn't really know much about Louise or or Helen. So, so it's been really fun, but I mean, I could see how potentially it could be a dicey relationship. And to be honest, um, you know, that's why I would, I personally would be very anxious about writing about someone who's like alive now, like Curtis Sittenfeld is very brave in my opinion. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. know, especially where she fictionalized, you know, Hillary's life so much and like right. whole different. Right. And, and I imagine Carrie for you, I mean, obviously like you wrote about Kick Kennedy first and in your first book, The Kennedy Debutante, who is a member of one of the most powerful families in, in our country's history, right. um, albeit maybe one of the lesser known Kennedys for most people. But then you take on Grace Kelly in the girl in my clubs and grace is somebody that people have strong feelings about and like i'm wondering did you have a, a a obviously there was something about grace kelly that drew you towards writing about her did you have a strong preconceived notion and did you sort of have to fight those preconceived notions of your own or you know did you have how did you go about making sure you were presenting when i read your book i felt like the grace kelly in that was better than the Grace Kelly that I had been picturing. So like, how did you well, go about- and She was a real that? person, I hope, is like, the, is that, that was sort of my goal. I mean, you know, unlike with Elise, I mean, you know what, it's funny when people say back to me exactly what you just said, I kind of think to myself, did I really do that? Yeah. <laughs> did I really write about a Kennedy and then Grace Kelly? Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> so, because honestly, when I was in the re sort of the research phases with the Kennedy book, and I had never tried historical fiction or anything like that before, like I had read The Paris Wife, like yeah. and a couple <laughs> of other like pieces of historical fiction. And um, I really was stuck. Like it took me a while to make myself sit down and actually write it because I, I was like, who am I to do this thing? Um, and I, I always like to tell this story. Two different writers from very, very different parts of my writing life wound up saying, I was expressing this anxiety to them um, uh, within like two weeks of each other. And they both said the same thing to me, which was that, Carrie, it's your book, isn't it? Yeah. And that was 
very liberating <laughs> for me. And then, um, you know, when we, when I was sort of getting ready to, to do what Elise is doing with the girl when the girl in white gloves came out, because I, because even more than Kit Kennedy, as you said, people have these ideas about Grace Kelly. She, she might have died in the early 80s, but boy, we are still watching her movies and people are still comparing wedding dresses to her wedding dress from 1956. So like she is on people's minds. And so I just, I sort of wanted to be prepared like for this question. And I, I somebody pointed me in the direction of Hilary Mantel wow. of Wolf, Wolf Hall fame. Okay. Hilary Mantel did these fabulous um, series of uh, interviews for the BBC um, and in, in one of the first, and there's these transcripts you can read, anyone can, you can go and Google them right now. But um, one of the things she said is that, you know, when we consume historical fiction, um, I, she said, like most, I think most readers understand and, and writers when we're doing it understand that we are not, it is not a replica. It is not a photograph. It is, it is an interpretation. It's much more like a painting. We, with the brush strokes left in. <laughs> and I'm, I'm paraphrasing it as they're not her words. She used much more beautiful words than I just used. But it, it's that I think, I think that that illustration of the difference between a photo and a painting with the brush strokes left in is really a powerful metaphor. And so I, I, that's what I feel that I am doing you know, especially with, with famous people. I mean, you know, you, I did need to make, to, to take some liberties. And sometimes I just had to say, okay, historical record. Like, I know this is what you say, but like, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta sort of move it in this way. And this is why we have the author's note also, at least referenced her author's note earlier. We, when we, when we kind of depart in bigger ways from the historical re record that we feel like we really need to account for those things, I think almost Oh, well, all writers I know are very responsible about saying that we've done it in the author's note. Like we knew what we were doing on on these particular issues. So I love that. That's such a great answer, both of you. Like the because there is the added element of of having to deal with real life and and having to fictionalize that uh, the the image of a painting rather than a photograph is so um, that's so spot on to me about how to how to do this from a craft perspective. Um, Carrie, do you want to maybe ask one or two more questions? And then I, I have a couple. Actually, the, the, the painting photograph thing is exactly sort of the, the perfect segue because Elise right. has written about a painter and a photographer also. Right. Um, and so that was actually one of the questions I wanted to ask you, Elise. So like, how was it different mm. or, and or similar writing about these three Olympians um, uh, uh, as it was to write about um, Amy um, Alcott in the other Alcott and um, uh, and um, Dorothy uh, Lang in Learning to See. Well, that is a great question. And to be honest, I haven't really thought about it, but I think the biggest difference in the case of both May Alcott, because Amy March- okay, That's right, the Amy's the character. Sorry, I knew I was getting that wrong. No, no. I mean, for most people out there, like Amy March is who they know, right? So there was kind of this really fun and interesting element of kind of trying to really think about the real woman behind this kind of comedic fictional character that is lives so large in the public kind of imagination. Um, both in the case of Amy March, or now you've got me doing it, in the case of May Alcott and Dorothea Lang, I mean, they're both pretty well-known historical figures, although Dorothea Lange is pretty interesting where everyone knows, let me see, everyone knows her famous photo, Migrant Mother, right? That's the iconic image. Right. But when I would say I was writing a novel about Dorothea Lange, I tended to actually get blank stares. Like people really don't know her by name. Once you know of her work though, it's everywhere. And it really is everywhere because she worked for the government for many years. And so her work is a part of the Library of Congress. So it actually can be replicated like in newspapers, magazines, very easily because it's part of the public domain. So I feel like both of uh, May Alcott and Dorothea Lang, like they were just much more publicly known and recognized. So even if like people didn't know Dorothea Lang's name, they had context for her. They could sort of understand her photography from the 30s or the Japanese inter internment of Japanese Americans. People had seen it, knew kind of where to place her. In the case of these women Olympians, 
I actually had a ton of free space is what I'll call it because no one really knew anything about them. Like when I'd say, oh, I'm writing, I'm working on a book about some pioneering women Olympians from the 20s and 30s. I would sort of get blank stares. People would be like, oh, I never really thought about, were there women there? Like everyone knows about the 1936 Olympics, largely through the boys in the boat, an awesome book and also Unbroken, right? By, about Louis Zamperini. Those two books and both are nonfiction have really kind of shaped I think our understanding of 1936, but there were women there and their stories are so unbelievable. Yet it was kind of freeing that no one, so few people have heard of Betty Robinson, Helen and Louise Stokes that I could kind of run with it. I really did have this very freeing feeling of like, oh, I am largely going to be kind of introducing this world to people for the first time. There is a huge gap in the world of novels about women athletes, there really is. I was kind of startled when I realized that. There is some great nonfiction, but even the nonfiction, there's not a ton of it. It's mostly focused on male athletes. So I'd say the biggest difference was just that I felt like I, while these are three real women, they're so unknown to most, pe most people that it was really liberating and fun. <laughs> That's great. So I didn't That's feel kind of like I was travel, like worrying about was I, were people going to be disappointed by this sort of record I was painting, this, this painting I was painting, as you will. Um, people just had no idea what to expect, I think. So that's been really yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, that's so great. Yeah, that is great. Um, well, so I have one other question. And, you know, I think um, in these times that we're living in, everyone's always interested in this, which is, um, how has your like life as a writer and your process and stuff changed in the last few months that we have all been home? Right. I mean, I, you know, boy, it's been humbling, hasn't it? Um, I would say, so I'm working on a new novel right now that's inspired by my grandfather's service during World War II. He was in the Pacific theater and I just knew nothing about the Pacific. I think Europe is, is very, um, has really drawn the sort of most of the attention these days, but there was, there's so much interesting stuff about what happened in the Pacific theater. And it led me to the story about US army nurses who were um, sort of trapped in the Philippines in the, in the war and they end up becoming prisoners of war. And they just have this amazing story of overcoming incredible odds to all survive. And um, honestly, I was able somehow, I still don't really know how this happened, but I was able to pull off a trip to the Philippines right before, right? You remember, Carrie, I was so anxious about this trip and should I go? And yeah. I went and somehow I made it home in one piece. Um, that was in the end of February. I went for a couple of weeks and came home February 29th, which was the same day that Washington State, where I live, declared a state of emergency. Um, honestly, I have been writing like crazy since quarantine which has been kind of nuts, but I had this trip fresh in my mind. And also these women's stories gave me some perspective, right? I mean, we are living through a hard time right now, but we have lived through hard times before. And so kind of being able to draw upon the resilience of these women has actually been hugely comforting. And it also really, the uncertainty that we live in now, I've really channeled that to writing about these women of like, they really didn't know. Were they going to be stuck in the Philippines for the rest of their lives? Was war the rest of their lives? I mean, I've been able to, I think, understand and kind of grapple with that sense of anxiety so much better than had I been living like the life of 2020 we all expected, right? So um, I have been writing a lot and, you know, then kind of launching a book. Although unlike in the past when I've had my book tour all lined up like months in advance, in this case, honestly, it was like the middle of June when I'm kind of like, okay, <laughs> nothing's really going to change by July 7th. I better figure out what I'm doing. Like pick up, you know, start emailing everyone like, Hey, will you have me on a zoom call or something? <laughs> so on the, like, yes, book touring is radically different from anything I've ever experienced before, but, but my writing life has, um, it's not always pretty. Like the dog will be barking and my kids are, you know, stressing about distance learning and I feel like this is all sort of thrust us into a situation of being just really trying to take care of one another and trying to be patient um, and present. It's hard. It's really hard when we're juggling our work lives at the same time we're juggling parenting and just holding it all together. So um, I think it, it's been kind of crazy to look out and just see everyone in their living room or in their bedroom or wherever, like we're suddenly getting like, 
behind behind the shiny veneer any of us usually throw up we're like yeah this is how it looks my messy bookshelf my dog snoring behind me <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah so, well yeah. you know you, it's funny you say this about you know um relating to your characters more i've heard this in particular from people who have written about um characters during one of the two world wars or are writing about characters during one of the two world wars so my war novel is currently behind me, although there's a, a moment in my upcoming book that has some um, World War II stuff, as you know. Um, but like when I was like trying not to use paper towels, among other things that I right? could not, yeah. I, and I was like, oh, this is rationing. rationing. Like right. it is not state enforced and it is nothing like what it was during World War II, but it did, yeah. it, it just, I was like, okay. It, and so, it, it is. I mean, I think that all of us who write historical fiction will be able to sort of bring, you know, an understanding of that anxiety level, like you said, um, to our writing that we might not have been able to before. Because all of us have it in one way or another, and it's very different for everybody. But um, yeah. And Carrie, yeah. how has that transition been for you? How's your writing going in? And it's going. Your, I mean, I'm, I'm slowly but surely doing it. And I, I have to say, like, you know, I wrote my first novel when my daughter was in nursery school and for, you know, three hours a day, you know, a few days a week. And I just got really good at dropping her off and being like, okay, second cup of coffee. I have two and a half hours. Go. Right. And that's kind of the way I'm writing now. Like I, you know, I have two and a half, I have two hours, go. Like, and and so that, you know, history kind of like is serving me well. So um And what's your latest project about? Oh, I am writing about Sylvia Beach, who is an American woman who in 1919 goes over to Paris and opens the original Shakespeare and Company bookstore in Paris, which becomes like the home of the lost generation. So, you know, um, James Joyce and Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald, all the famous, you know, writers that you think of um, in the glamorous 1920s um, were fixtures in her bookstore. And um, a less known fact about her is that in 1922, she publishes the very first edition of James Joyce's Ulysses, like his world changing masterpiece Ulysses, after it's been banned and convicted of obscenity <laughs> in a big trial in New York City. So that is what I'm writing about next. So it's Paris between the wars. So it's kind of bookended by both of the wars. I love that. More cool women are on our way from both, yes. both of you. And mentioning Shakespeare and Company, this is a great time to talk about um, the fabulous independent bookstores that um, you know we're all still supporting. Um, we of course want you to purchase Elise's Fast Girls and Carrie's The Girl in the White Gloves. Um, and we, we do ask that if you, if you do consider purchasing one from an independent bookstore because these stores are really hurting right now. Um, and we want to have doors to walk through when this is all finally over. We want these stores to still exist. They're so important to our communities. They're so important to our writing lives. Um, and I wanna give a shout out first of all to Newtonville Books um, where you guys met. And then um, Elise specifically would like to give a shout out to Paper Book Booksellers, um, which just opened, as I, I understand it, right before this happened. Uh, so that is really, um, you know, what a tough time to open a store um, and to then have this happen, especially bookstores. Oh. I know. They have signed and, copies and I can even walk there from my house. I mean, I'm so, we need to keep them in business because I can walk to the shop from my house and sign and personalize books. So paper boat booksellers, I, I really want them to survive all this. It's a beautiful store. It's so beautifully curated. Mm. I love that. And you also mentioned Island Books, which also has signed copies as well. And yes. So many of these independent bookstores do have signed copies of authors' books and they- And, and we'll ship. Yeah. They, you don't yeah. you don't have to be like you know go it, it, even if you don't live in C the seattle area you can use the bookstores that elise just mentioned even if you don't live in the boston area you can use newtonville books right something else that i think that it wasn't even really on my radar until recently that i just want to like put a plug in because i know elise and i are also both really big audiobook listeners yes um is that you can patronize your whatever independent yeah. bookstore you want through libro fm Oh. You can you can subscribe. It's 
to um, their audiobook service and you specify which independent bookstore you are patronizing. So I am, I am doing my Libro FM through my local independent bookstore, which is Wellesley Books, another really tremendous and fabulous um, independent bookstore. Um, so please, please consider doing that. Like if you are at all interested in audiobooks, they, they, they have a great trial, like one or two month trial. It's not very expensive. Um, and especially in these days of quarantine, when we're all home, it is such a pleasure to like do your laundry and putter around your house while you're listening to a great book. So yeah. that's my, that's my yeah. indie bookstore thing for the day. That's and so I, think, great. I think actually Libro FM is even running a promotion where if you're changing from a different audio service, they'll even like give you three free books or something. So it's Ooh, definitely great. Wow worth checking out their website and um no matter where you buy your books you know i think i don't know carrie and J do you guys have book plates like i can send people book plates that are signed if you send me a message through my website all that good stuff look at yeah. that so you can get all of the up close and personal <laughs> things this is what i love though that that i think authors especially have pivoted so well to making sure that you still have that personal connection. And please feel free, we of course want you to follow these ladies on um, on social media, please. Um, like we'll, we'll link to their Facebooks and their Instagrams and Twitter, and we want you to follow them on social media, visit their websites and say hello. You know, I mean, like people love, <laughs> yes, we love to hear do. <laughs> from people who read books, you know, there's nothing better than when you read a book and you send an author a message saying, you know what, this really helped. And I find, especially right now, I mean, these books are just, they're, they're making my life better. So yeah. thank you for continuing to write them. Thank you for letting us all um, take a moment away from our daily reality, which is not always so wonderful and, and step into a place that not only is a beautiful escape, but also makes us, makes us think critically, also gives us a fresh perspective on where we are right now, expands our horizons, teaches us something we didn't know, especially when it comes to historical fiction. Um, you ladies are both so, so awesome. And I can't thank you enough for being here. I have one more question for both of you, which is one of my favorite questions to ask people right now, which is if you could spend this summer instead of where we are right now and perhaps journey to a year in the past um perhaps a, a year from one of your books and spend time with one of your characters uh or not you can spend time <laughs> with another, you could spend time with another his literary character too um i i give you full license the, the full literary canon uh who would it be when would it be and what would you do <laughs> please <laughs> first but I know, well, this yeah. one is actually an easy one for me because I'm so bummed that we don't have the Tokyo Games this summer. Oh, um, I'm going to the Olympics and I'm going to Hitler's 1936 <laughs> Berlin Games. And if I really get to choose, I'm going as a track star or maybe a tennis star since I play tennis. Yeah. Um, I think actually I wouldn't have to be, you know, I could, I could, I would love all these other women, love to meet them. Berlin was such a strange place during this period. The things I read about nightclubs with pneumatic tubes that you would send messages from table to table. And um, there was a lot of intrigue. All of it sounds very, um, I would love to see this firsthand. I am I am there. <laughs> I hope, I, I'm crossing my fingers for the movie so that we get to, to see this. <laughs> How about you, Carrie? Well, so I, I'm, I've been totally like, a, you know, I, I've always loved the 1920s and I've been like living in the 1920s for the last year with this book. So I think I would have to choose um, France more broadly in 19, the summer of 1925, when every writer you know of was there and they were like going back and forth between the Cote d'Azur and Paris, <laughs> like going to fabulous parties, all, all the things. So, I think I would have to do that yeah. <laughs> with God, like, just like my champagne coop yeah. you know, on the train. <laughs> yes, the champagne coop, going to the parties. Your gloves. So yeah, but, yeah, right. And, and like the cigarette and the lighter, the, the, like my, you know, anyway. The red the smells over, we will all get together and we will have a champagne, a oh, champagne party and exactly. celebrate, you know, the survival <laughs> of this and and look forward to more awesome reads for you from you ladies. Thank you again so much for being here. Carrie Mayer, author of The Girl in the White Gloves, and Elise Hooper, author of Fast Girls. Um, please, again, go pick these up. Follow, follow these wonderful authors. Um, say hello. 
grab grab the books from an independent bookstore and have a great day. Um, we have another celebrity conversation coming up at 4 p.m. Uh, so come back and join us. And uh, thank you, ladies. Thank you once again. Thank, thank you so you. much, Jenna. Thank Happy you so day. much. It's been such a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me too.